Hi everybody, I'm Mary Carrillo and you're Inside Tennis with the Kaz, the legend. Hi tennis fans, the Kaz here with you for another half hour inside the world of tennis. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Discover the Lake Club, the most exclusive lifestyle in the best-selling luxury village in Lakewood Ranch. With a grand clubhouse, indoor and outdoor dining, spa, and the grand opening of six tennis and pickleball courts along with resort-style pools, the Lake Club has it all. Come tour 13 luxury models from the area's premier home builders and discover our newest neighborhoods, Genoa and Lakeview Estates. The luxury, the lifestyle, the Lake Club. Hi, I'm Coco and you're inside tennis with the cause. Hi, tennis fans. Terrific as always to be with you. We are doing the show opening on location at the Lake Club. I am extremely honored to be representing the Icon Management team as the Director of Tennis at the Lake Club. Wonderful to see our Elizabeth Moore Sarasota Open players. Tennis Sangren, Tommy Paul, Nick Krios, and Michael Moe. Doing so well at the Australian Open, the 2018 Elizabeth Moore Sarasota Open champion Sangren reached the quarterfinal men's singles after an impressive win over number eight seed Matteo Berrettini. 2019 Elizabeth Moore Sarasota Open champion Paul defeated number 18 seed Grigor Dimitrov in five sets to reach the round of 32. And congratulations to Braden Sinsmo winning his first slam singles match. And on the women's side, representing the Sunshine State, Sonia Cannon wins the Australian Open women's singles. At age seven, it is hard to guarantee who is going to be a champion. However, Rick Macy coach Sonia Cannon appears to have what is needed to get to the top. Why do you want to be a tennis pro? Um, because I want to be a champion and I want to be number one in the world. I like the way you hit the ball. You always get the ball back. How do you do that? I prepare early and and then I try to let the ball come forward and that I could hit the ball to somebody. How much are you practicing? How long are you on the tennis court every day? Three hours. Three hours every day. Do you know other tennis pros? Do you have a favorite tennis pro? Who is it? Andy Roddick. Oh. Oh, do you know Andy Roddick? Yeah. How do you know Andy Roddick? Because I saw someone else standing over there when he was serving, when somebody was returning his serve. Would you like to play with Andy Roddick someday? Yeah. Do you think you could ever return Andy Roddick's serve? Yes. How? If I split and I prepare early and when I do a short back swing. A split, prepare early, short back swing. You've had some coaching, haven't you? Who's your coach? My dad. Your dad. Anybody? Your dad's a good coach. Anybody else coach you? Rick Macy. Oh, Rick Macy, the big M. So you've got good coaches, girl. Good coaches, fast feet. You are going someplace, little rising star, Sonia. Good to see you. Thanks. When I tell everybody about you, that day at Andy Roddick's fundraiser, Art Stites wanted me to meet you. And we were interviewing, but we didn't have any B-roll. I had a coat, I had dress shoes on. You and I went out to rally. The story yeah. doesn't stop there. We had a 40-ball rally because of you. You hit every ball into my strike zone. Did your father, Alex, 
teach to you the respect of the ball and finding the strike strike zone. That's that's so seldom. <laughs> yeah, I re actually I remember that day. Yeah, he taught me. He's a big um, impact on me on my career. And yeah, obviously I wanted to look good in front of you over there. So <laughs> <laughs> I made 40 balls in a court then. Yeah, your face always looks good in front <laughs> of the world. And we're seeing a lot of you these days in the uh, post-match conferences here. A nice win on Monday, but my gosh, what's this one feel like? Uh, amazing. Sakara is a yeah. big win, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I beat her at Wimbledon, and I knew she was going to play really good, and she's had a lot of great results, and I knew it was going to be a tough match, and she was going to make me work to win, and I'm really happy. I mean, the numbers are on your side. This is the third year, 0-17, 18, 20, 16, What's it feel like? You like you're getting to like this place, aren't you? Yeah, I love this place. New York is my favorite city. I want to live here and pursue fashion. That's not a story, whatever. Um, but yeah, I love the crowd. Everything is just amazing here. And I feel like I'm playing my best tennis here. So you got a streak? You know how to keep a streak? You keep winning? Yes, I'm gonna to try to keep winning. I would love to. Believe me. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, this is exciting. I guess the fact that I'm beating these top players, um, but I always knew I can do it, and I'm just really happy with the way I'm playing, and having these wins, it just does a lot for my confidence, and yeah, I'm just really proud of myself. I feel like I'm just being more aggressive, trying to uh, take control in every point, and sometimes find my way to the net, which obviously helps, but um, yeah, I just feel like I'm more of a solid player. I'm, my movement is really good, and I'm defending a lot of balls back. And what about Coco Goff? Again beating Venus Williams and another slam. And then defeating Australian Open reigning champion Naomi Osaka. Then we will take a personal look and see how Coco made her tennis breakthrough. Hey, it was fun covering the United Tennis Academy Championships with our local junior tennis talent. We are looking forward to the West Coast Senior Men's Tour at GT Bray, Lakewood National, the Meadows Country Club, and Palmer Country Club. The tennis world lost a major contributor to the game with the recent passing of Mike De Palmer. De Palmer and Nick Bolletieri started the Nick Bolletieri Tennis Academy. Mike himself was a player, reaching a world rank of number 20 in doubles. He was a legendary coach at all levels of the game, including juniors, world-class family members, and preeminent NCAA championship achievements. So what's new on the show today? Well, we have another great one for you. You will visit Coco Goff, launching her career from the juniors to the pros. And you will sit down with sportscaster Superwoman and former French Open mixed doubles champion with John McEnroe, the legendary Mary Carrillo. So let's get it launched with Coco. I mean, we really wanted to bring to life um, the French culture and the ambience of the Roland Garros. So I think we achieved with that and everybody seemed to be enjoying it. So we're very happy. This has been such an incredible week. Uh, the partnership we have and to be able to hold an event like this, the Rendezvous, has been tremendous for the club. The members have rallied behind it the whole week. What amazing matches today. Unbelievable. Well, Coco, I don't know where to start. You didn't lose a set all week. No. You're 13 years old. Yes. You have no rights winning some of these events. How do you feel about this? Um, I feel really ec ecstatic. Um, I really love the crowd and the facility, and I thought that I just had an advantage because this is in my own backyard, so I really, really love Boca West. It was really amazing to see. When I walked in on the first day, I was really overwhelmed and I thought I was going to get nervous playing in front of the crowd, but really I wasn't nervous. I was more comfortable playing with the crowd and that really helped me pull out the win today. You're out here coaching Coco. She is as mature as anybody at age 13. Is that a gift? Has she trained to be as mature and composed as she can be on the court in post-match interviews? I am impressed. Uh, she'd be trained to be that way because she's one of me number one and the greatest, so I'm trying to put all the effort to her and her successful career. 
This is the first time that I've been in the position to give someone else a trophy. Um, so yeah, it was exciting and I mean, it's amazing that she's only 13 years old and she has such a bright future, so um, it was really an honor to be able to be here. How about the opponent? In my book, she may be the player to watch out there. Oh, for sure. I mean, when you're 13 years old and, and the only other uh, younger people in the finals are like Martina Hingis and Jennifer Capriati, you have to like uh, what the future holds for Coco Goff. Well, Coco, every time you play, you want to win. I know that. Today, you came up a bit short, but you entered this U.S. Open. You have to listen to this carefully. As a 13-year-old, you win five rounds without losing a set. <laughs> You beat the number five seed. You had an indirect win over the number three seed. What are you taking away from this event? Um, definitely, I'm taking away confidence. Um, I'm proud to be here, and um, I had so much fun um, playing U.S. Open, and I hope to be back in the future. Coco, so good to see you here in Sarasota, Florida. Within a year, many things have happened. We were together at Boca West Country Club. You know what was happening there? The Rolling Garros Rendezvous, mm -hmm. French Open Wild Card. Age 13, you win it? Yeah. Next time we were together, Flushing Meadows, U.S. Open Juniors. Mm -hmm. You were a finalist. You came in number two. What do you like about this tennis life? You're on the tour. You're young to be on the tour. I'll share your age if that's okay. Yeah. You just turned 14. Yes. Goodness yeah. gracious, where do you get all the composure to play like a young adult on the court, all the composure off the court to give some of the best interviews anybody mm -hmm. at age 14 has ever mm -hmm. given? So what's it all about there, Coco? Uh, it all comes from my dad and my mom. They usually they teach me a lot, and I get a lot of advice from them, so they help. Talk yeah. about advice. Many people have an eye on you, and it's a good eye they have on you. What kind of advice are you getting from some of the tour players, former tour players, current tour players? Um, they just tell me to keep with it, you know, stay positive during my matches, and just, I mean, you're going to have some tough losses, but just to keep going. Were you ever overwhelmed when some of the real players came to you and started to talk to you? What was that like? Were you ready for that? Uh, yeah, I was a little overwhelmed because you see them on TV. I've been seeing them since on TV since I was six or seven, and you know you get a little nervous. And but it's really cool to when you look back at it. It's really cool, and plus the pictures are always great. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like mixing the juniors with the pro tour? Um, definitely, I get to see the different levels. Um, this is my first pro um, tournament, so it's cool to see the levels. And then I'll take it into when I play um, Rolling Garros. I'll take that, um, my what I've learned here, and just move it to my junior matches. And then I'll probably be going pro soon. Musical performances from top acts, including Austin Mahone, Blanco Brown, Meg Donnelly, Jack Mack, and J.D. McQuarrie. Along with tennis stars Novak Djokovic, Rafa Nadal, Sloane Stevens, the Bryan Brothers, and Coco Goff. You know, last night watching that 15-year-old girl, just amazing. I haven't seen anyone that could cover a court like she can, north, south, east, west. And yet she met the number one player in the country, obviously, who was terrific yesterday. And what a beautiful moment. Touching just moment. touching moment. Sportsmanship, class, handle it so well. Of course, the big story was Coco. And please, I believe losing was a necessity. And... How the loss was handled was magnificent. And let me tell you why. Do and getting so much publicity at such a young age can in the future hurt you. Coco, you have a great future. Learn from that loss. And remember something. You have a lot of people behind you, including your family. Candy, Corey, the big question the world wants to know, what is it like coming to the U.S. Open 
but not coming as a spectator. You're here as mom and dad of the most highly respected junior player ever in the world to make the splash that she made. So what's that like coming to watch now? Well, it's very stressful watching her as a parent. Um, I have to make sure I take my high blood pressure medicine because she sends me on a world of emotions, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. But in the end is um, happiness because we have seen her live out her dream. Yeah, for me, it's a lot of stress watching the matches, but we're doing what parents are supposed to do, cheering on our kids, uh, trying to give her the support she needs to continue to live her dreams. One of our mottos is no regrets, and we want to make sure that we're doing our job as a parent, at least to 18, not to 21, because when you're officially an adult, you can't look back and blame mom and dad for anything that's going on as an adult. So our first job, number one, is to be a parent, to making sure that you're raising your child. That's job number one. And then part of being a parent is, is helping them and supporting them in what are dreams that they, they want to do. Most importantly, keep enjoying the family the way you do. Gandhi, thank you very much. Corey, thank you very thank you. much. Good to see you, and thank you for always supporting her. Oh, you make it easy, you know that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, for me, it's still wild, you know. This is the first time, like some, well, not first, the first round was the first time I actually had a chant, but today it was a lot louder and a lot more consistent. And um, I was literally like, thinking, like, um, maybe I feel like I'm um, Golden State and game seven or something <laughs> like it's different because like you're an individual player and so it's weird I guess because most of the time when you hear the chances for like a whole team not just for like me so it was pretty cool discover the lake club the most exclusive lifestyle in the best-selling luxury village in Lakewood Ranch with a grand clubhouse indoor and outdoor dining spa and the grand opening of six tennis and pickleball courts along with resort style pools the lake club has it all Come to our 13 luxury models from the area's premier home builders and discover our newest neighborhoods, Genoa and Lakeview Estates. The luxury, the lifestyle, the Lake Club. Nick Voluntary watching Inside Tennis with my man, The Cause. Welcome back, tennis fans. Hope that you enjoy the remainder of the show with sportscaster giant, Mary Carrillo. Catching up with Mary Carrillo. Always Mary, a pleasure, <laughs> Pleasure's mine, and you know that. First time we met on air, we're chatting about- oh, Wait, the how long ago were we uh, talking about? A number of good years, Mary, a number of good years. Well, the question was, Mary, we know how much fun you had on Court Central with John playing mixed doubles, John McEnroe. Yep. How much fun were you having in the booth at the U.S. Open? And you politely said, what? well, we had more fun on the court playing, <laughs> and he really didn't know about women taking over in men's tennis. <laughs> Two weeks later, I talked to him. John, we know how you feel about women calling men's matches. Yes. Have you ever called a, a women's match, and will you ever? I haven't. Will I ever? I don't know. But I know what it's like being in the delivery room with six kids, but I don't know what it's like delivering a baby. What was I going to say to you that? That says it all, John. That's Mary. What you said. <laughs> That's all I could say. Yeah. Mary, you said it wasn't great, but you knew it was going to get better and well. Yeah. How much better has it gotten? No, you it's, can't get any better. It's, it's, and by the way, John McEnroe, cause, uh, he, came, he started being in the booth just around the time that Venus Williams and Serena Williams showed up, and they became such great stories that John was more than happy to start calling women's tennis matches. And it's been, I still work with John. We still, we, we've been working here at the U.S. Open for Amazon Prime UK. I work with him at the French Open for NBC. When you sit next to John McEnroe, you got a pretty good seat. <laughs> well, your seat's not so bad either that you bring. Well, you bring something. The smile, the voice <laughs> are the trademark of female broadcast. Well, your smile and your voice are pretty famous around here on the men's side, Well, too. you bring it out, Mary. Come on, stop. But, uh, Mary, when you say something, the voice itself commands respect. We know you know your stuff. How blessed are you to have that beautiful voice? No, I'm, I've had it for a while now. I've always kind of, <laughs> I've always kind of sounded like this. I've been in... Uh, darkened movie theaters where I'll just say I'll talk you know they're still in you know 
previews and I'll say something and somebody in the dark will say, Hey, aren't you Mary Gorilla? <laughs> they can hear me just from my voice. So it's been good. It's, it's gotten me around. Uh, and I hope I get to, to keep using my voice for a long while. This has been a spectacular U.S. Open in terms of storylines. Story Haven't you been busy? I have been busy. I'll bet. Uh, tracking down what you're covering an hour before I got it. So it, <laughs> it, is, it is fun. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And I want to talk to you about the Open. But you brought up something, the movies. You were on the big screen yourself. <laughs> How cool was that and what was that like? And have you ever spent more time getting ready for two minutes of delivery? <laughs> I was in a movie called Wimbledon um, and it came out a bunch of years ago and I was only supposed to be in one scene and so great. So I, I did my thing. I was interviewing the guy who ends up, you know, in the final of Wimbledon, the, like the journeyman. And then half a year later, uh, the production company for that movie called me back and said, we've changed the script, we need you back again for a second scene. And I said, um, okay, but, you know, I'm back in the say. I wasn't, they flew me to England, my hair had changed, it, was, it wasn't as, I think it was shorter or longer or it was a different color, so they colored my hair and gave my, just for continuity, because you didn't want to look totally different, you know, let's face it, Wimbledon only lasts two weeks. So I could, I, I wasn't allowed to change my looks that much, and I shot a second scene, and I absolutely enjoyed it, yeah. And, and it still airs, it, it's a, I don't think it made that big a deal in the States, but in, in Great Britain during Wimbledon, it's, it's on all the time. It's all right, fun. right behind us, a man who gave it to everyone in broadcast, you and I, we're at the, the colony down in Sarasota, yeah. I introduced you. What an honor that was, Mary. You I introduced. That. Oh boy, that was a great night. A yeah. great night. And in the background, it was "I Will Survive," which was a segue for me to interview Bud Collins yeah. because he was fighting the colon cancer back then. But Mary, what has Bud given you that you will never stop giving your your guests and your audiences. Well, I, honestly, I, got, I was lucky, because uh, I got to work with Bud on a couple of different networks for many years. And as great an authority as he was, I mean, he was the guy we always looked for when we needed a, a fact or some historical knowledge or whatever. He, he did this job with a sense of joy and playfulness that really rubbed off on me. I find myself now uh, trying so hard to have the same attitude when I cover matches that Bud did because he really, not only did he enjoy the sport, he liked the players, he liked the moment, he un and he gave players and, and the rest of us a sense of where this falls in the grand scheme of things. So I, I, every time I step in the booth, I can honestly say that I think of Bud and what he would make of all this. There are times when I would get really angry at, at a player or at the ATP or something, and Bud would just have this sort of kind smile, and he would know that, all right, this is gonna change, the world is just gonna keep making it spin around the sun, and this will all pass. And I learned, I learned that lesson from him. And again, just, he, wasn't he fun to have around? Oh, and you felt, man. as soon as Bud Collins walked into um, the press room, no matter where it was, you felt like the occasion was bigger. You felt like the tournament was bigger, that the match meant more because Bud Collins was there calling it. A beautiful man indeed. Yeah. I thought you were coordinating the wardrobe after Bud today. A lot of nice passion uh, pastels today, passion uh, pastels. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very, very nice. HBO, Hallmark, you do it all. You get into the Olympics, you mix the sports. How big of a thrill is it to be covering all these sports? And you know them. You do your homework, Carrillo. I, I do my homework, but honestly, because the only sport I'm fluent in is tennis. Um, all the other stuff, I don't have to be the expert, which is a very good thing, because when you're covering... Your voice carries it, though, Mary, <laughs> you know that. Well, no, it, I, I mean, it, I, storytelling, that's what... I think that's what so many of us here want to do. We want to tell stories, and we like the athletic heart, and we want to figure out how it beats and you know why people can come from nowhere and make it all the way to the top or you know I mean there there are so many things that engage us right when we're at, at a tennis room it's not just how the match goes it's it's all that other stuff that makes it so much fun uh, indeed it is your favorite charity you do so many of those Mary Ah, uh, there's a lot I mean I 
I try to be uh, as busy as possible. Normally, anything that is attached to Billie Jean King, I'll, I'll try to be a part of, you know, whether it's the Women's Sports Foundation or any, of, or any of her many charities. There are so many good people who do good work. Andy Roddick has become a favorite of mine. I got to do something with, with Andy and, and Roger Federer last fall for his charity. I mean, he does so much work uh, for underserved kids back in Austin, Texas. Uh, Roger Federer, uh, we, we are blessed that so many tennis players really do care and give back. So anytime I can be uh, a small part of that or, uh, you know, give my, my money or my services to them. Chris Everett's got an amazing charity. She's ra raised over $20 million, you know, her annual event. We're lucky. Oh, we are. We are, we're really we are. lucky, we aren't are. we? Oh, we are. And Roddick, we know he can cry because he cried when he won the slam here, but he cries at his foundation every year when he talks about those kids. Oh, he really means it. I, I love Andy, and I, I, what I really respect, and he's the last American man to win a singles major, as we all, as we all know, and it was here back in 2003, so I'd love for somebody else to come along. But what I always admired most about Andy Roddick is he won this. He won his first major. He was only 21 years old. He never won another one, but he spent the rest of his career trying to get better. Mm. Trying to, and he always worked hard, and he had a number of really good coaches. All he wanted to do was get better, and that's why when you can nominate him for the Hall of Fame. First you were time, there. Oh, I, he got my vote. He got just for Davis Cup and everything else he's done. And, and uh, yeah, so again, Andy, they, so many of these players do terrific work. U.S. Open time, 2019. Many slants. Take it in some directions, Mary. Uh, in terms of in terms of the storylines here. Story into, lines. Oh man! I mean, for me, it's we're we're into the men's quarterfinals. I think Rafa Nadal has got a terrific chance to win his second major of the year, and that would get him within just one, right, of Roger Federer's 20 titles. I mean, that's he's never been as close as he is now to getting close to Roger. Um, that to me is a huge storyline on the women's side. Obviously, Serena trying to win this thing. She's been in three major finals since she had a baby, and she hasn't come good yet. I'm get, I always assume that Serena's good. Every time she's in the draw, no matter what her state is, I've always said she's going to win. Um, but she lost last year's Wimbledon. She lost last year's U.S. Open. She lost at the Australian, having match points in the quarters to Pliskova. She lost it in the Wimbledon final to Halep. Cos, I'm just going to keep picking her. This is the I'm year, I believe, going to, keep to return. Picking Serena until she gets to 24, until she ties uh, Margaret Court's Grand Slam record and goes beyond. I just, I want to see it. You know, we've had this storyline for a long while now. I would very much like to see Serena get there. Well, there you see it. You become a friend of Carrillo. You're a friend for life, <laughs> Mary. That's for sure. Always thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, my friend. Thank you. Tennis fans, great to have you with us on Inside Tennis with the Cause. We love our sponsors, and you will too. Stop by and see them. But until then, remember in tennis scoring, love means nothing. But love of the game means everything. Keep alive your love of the game. Love you, tennis fans. And we'll see you right here every Saturday, 1230 on SNN. Everybody, I'm Mary Carrillo, and you're inside tennis with the Cause, the legend.